Hey guys, this is Eckhart Slaughter. Hello and welcome to another video. Now, today's upload might be a little bit different than I'm sure most of you guys are expecting, and I do want to actually apologize for that because I know a lot of you guys subscribe to this channel for Star Wars lore, and today I'll be showing you guys some Empire at War gameplay, albeit some with a lot of lore involved. Specifically, I'll be re uploading a video that originally appeared on my second channel, basically implementing Grand Admiral Thrawn's strategies in Empire at War which I personally do think is pretty cool. The reason why I'm doing this today is a couple of reasons. First of all, it is Father's Day, so I've been out and about all day. And second, because I actually broke my toe the other day. I dropped a cement block on it and just shattered it. It was terrible. So I kind of wanted to take a couple of days off. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoy. And if you do, make sure you subscribe to X2. There's tons of content over there like this. And I think we got a pretty good thing going on with nearly seven streams and videos a week. Anyway, let's roll the video. Grand Admiral Thrawn was easily the greatest military mind in Star Wars history. He brought the much more powerful New Republic to its knees through a combination of determination, genius military planning, and unbeatable tactics. Today we'll be looking at the tactics and strategies used by Grand Admiral Thrawn and applying them to Empire at War. Not only showing you guys how the tactician worked in Star Wars Legends, but also making you a better Empire at War player. With that being said, I've separated this video into different sections for each strategy and tactic, and I've included time codes to each one down in the description. You might be familiar with some of them already, but generally, I think this video will make you guys better players and will be interesting overall. With that being said, let's get started. Alright, so the first technique is one that I'm sure many of you are already familiar with, even if you don't know it by its name. We're talking first about the Thrawn Pincer. Now, we covered a variant of this strategy in my last sort of Star Wars Empire at War tutorial video, but right now I want to look specifically at how Thrawn pioneered this very interesting technique. Now, in the expanded universe, in the actual books, he needed to use an interdictor star destroyer. We don't need to here. Basically, the general principle was that you can't precisely jump in a specific ship in the middle of battle in a way that'll be, you know, right where you expect it to be. You might want to call a Victory Star Destroyer here, but it might end up over here. It might be hundreds of kilometers away. So what Thrawn did is he had his Interdictor Star Destroyers generate a gravity well, basically a cone of artificial gravity, and he would use that to precisely call in his capital ships. Essentially, he forced them out of hyperspace in a way that would be tactically advantageous. We don't need to do that in Empire War, but we can still follow the basic principles. Thrawn liked to do this with Victory Star Destroyers, probably because they were fairly mobile. They weren't as important as Imperial Star Destroyers, so they didn't need to be on the battle the entire time. And they could output a lot of firepower right away. He used Victory Star Destroyers like this at the Battle of Coruscant, for example. So, let's take this Victory, for example. It's locked in on this Dreadnought-class heavy cruiser, another very common Thrawn-era warship, and once it's sort of finally honed in on its target, you call the Victory Star Destroyer in at extreme close range. And then you just broadside it. You've probably given some relief for your Dreadnought, which can fly away, and you've got the upper hand now in a battle. Usually, you don't want to go in with just one ship, though, Bring another Star Destroyer. And this is a practice that's very common in Empire at War, but just the general principle of surprising your enemy, bringing in ships where they don't expect it works really well. This is doubly the case where a ship is out of position, like this Assault Frigate. If we drop a Star Destroyer here, I mean, obviously it's an Assault Frigate, so it's at a disadvantage naturally, but we're also hitting it with our full broadside, um, and it can't really respond meaningfully. We did a whole video on this, again, earlier this week, so if you want to see this expanded and how it can be brought to fleet action, I'll try to remember to put a link in the upper right-hand corner. But this one's pretty simple, let's move on. Alright, we're at the galactic map now because instead of looking at specific battle tactics, I want to talk about Thrawn's general strategy. So Grand Admiral Thrawn was of course representing the Empire, but he wasn't fighting a traditional war against the New Republic. 
As I mentioned in the intro, he had much fewer resources than the New Republic, much less ships, almost no territory because of the Imperial Warlords still fighting. So instead of just fighting a traditional war where he would slug it out in the battlefield, he really used rebel tactics, hit and fade runs, um, hitting soft targets when they weren't properly defended. And this is a strategy that you can really abuse in Empire at War, especially when playing a me medium level AI or even a hard AI without something like cruel AI in Thrawn's Revenge. So what we're talking about here is taking a small detachment of ships. Right now we've got a medium sized fleet, three Star Destroyers, I think, um, but still. We've got most of our um, assets where they need to be to defend um, whatever sector of the galaxy or achieve whatever objective that we have generally. But we also have the planet of Kuat. This is a major shipbuilding world. It's uh, got a dreadnought shipyard, so that represents a lot of assets. And we can go in there. We don't need to win a battle. We just need to destroy the shipyard. And um, that's something Thrawn did all the time. He would go in... Um, sometimes attack multiple places at the same time, which you would use battle meditation to do um, from Joris Sabayoth. You don't really need that in Empire at War. Um, but there's always an objective behind an objective, really. Whether it's moving the enemy out of position, or in this case, just getting in, destroying the shipyard, and not really caring about what happens in the greater battle. Because if we can take out this little four shipyard in this part of the galaxy, there's not really another source for New Republic capital ships. So... This is kind of similar to what we did last time. We can spring the bait if we want. Right. Um, imagine there being a larger defensive force, I guess. It would make it a little more interesting, but this should be fine just to show, um, I guess, the general strategy. Even if there were 10 Star Destroyers here and we couldn't get past them, we don't need to. All we need to do is survive long enough to destroy this shipyard. So it is a bit more difficult now because they've increased, at least in the Thrawn's Revenge mod, it's different for each mod. They've decreased the zone around stations um, at which you can't uh, jump into hyperspace, which kind of makes sense, but it makes this technique Hold a little on. more difficult. If you are sure. But still. These are stations that are meant to be protected. You can take advantage of AI behavior and kind of the weird, the weird way the AI works. Plus, especially when you're playing with the Empire, the massive amount of damage you can deal out quickly to uh, take out targets like this and get out pretty cleanly. And again, don't have to use that many resources. We're talking three Star Destroyers here to um, take out a very important asset. And even if there was a larger defensive fleet, this strategy is still very possible. You just gotta be quick. Um, and sometimes you gotta trick the AI into thinking you're attacking them uh, in a more traditional sense. Maybe call more ships in back here. They, they, uh, or let the fleet get closer. It's a, uh, it's all a bit of a gamble, I guess. Out of Draw their fire. Um, Star Destroyers attack. work really well for this, but there are definitely better ships. A victory or a pack of victories might even be better or very small and fast ships. Um, but this is what we had on hand. So I thought I'd show you guys with this and it's done. So we can retreat now. We'll be fine. Ships have taken hardly any damage. Um, that fleet is out of position. We can go. And again, we don't need to worry about these defending ships. We're more concerned about just destroying the asset and leaving. Part of that too plays into intelligence. Um, Grand Admiral Thrawn in the Thrawn trilogy relied heavily on things like spies. He had a source within the Imperial Palace. He understood how the New Republic operated, how they'd be moving their ships. Um, and you can take advantage of that too in Empire at War. You can bring a massive fleet at, say, Farafin here, and the AI will respond by moving ships to Coruscant. Then you hit Kuat. Now they've got no shipbuilding in this territory, um, besides down for Fondor. And you can get that intelligence. You can actually see where ships are by building things like probe droids. Where are they at? in this menu oh yeah right here so 30 for 30 credits you can essentially monitor the movement um, of all ships in nearby systems so if you wanted to attack coruscant for example 
which I don't I never want to fight a battle over Coruscant because I always anticipate them having a cannon on the ground you get in there um, well, it's undefended you destroy the space station and you leave then if you need to you can come back later or with Kuat You don't want to fight it there. Well, they've got that level for um, Shipyard facility because it will be pumping out those MC 80 B's so take advantage of the intelligence Strike where they're weakest. It all seems like common sense But there's ways that you can do it in Empire at War to sort of maximize your effectiveness Sorry, one final thing I wanted to mention before we go on to the next topic. The Essential Guide to Warfare talks about how Thrawn's strategy of using a relatively small but very mobile fleet allowed him to really shore up and defend the key planets that he did have. And that's one thing I really like doing in Empire at War. I like establishing certain choke points, like for example, if you hold Bill Bringy, then basically all of this sector of space, if you also hold uh, Merker, is protected you hold two planets you put massive fleets here and then even if you don't have that many ships you can use them as a roving fleet to hit the enemy where they don't want to be hit while not sacrificing your overall defensive position but let's continue all right so now i want to talk about fleet composition and fleet positioning and we get a lot about composition in the thrawn trilogy but not as much about actual positioning so much of what I'll talk about in that respect comes from other source books like the Imperial source book and later Rebel Alliance source books. So just keep that in mind. So when it comes to fleet composition, Grand Admiral Thrawn was pretty radical, especially when compared to the Empire. Now, in theory, the Empire did have a ratio of Star Destroyers to support ships that they were supposed to maintain, but practically that didn't really happen. Grand Admiral Thrawn, however, was not all talk in that respect. We see at the Battle of Bilbringi that Star Destroyers were not the dominant ship at that battle. I mean, together they did have the most firepower, but there was pretty much one Dreadnought class heavy cruiser for every Star Destroyer. What's more though, he also used support ships like the Lorinar Strike Cruiser we have here um, and the uh, Lancer Frigate that we have there to pretty great effectiveness actually. And the Essential Guide to Warfare actually talks about how the Lancer, which was underused by other factions, actually saw a lot of success under Grand Admiral Thrawn. And I mean, it's pretty obvious why. Star Destroyers alone don't have a lot in the way of anti-fighter, but they do a lot of good things, like the turbo laser damage is really exceptional, especially when compared to other New Republic ships of similar sizes. The, uh, the Strike Cruiser and the Dreadnought, and even um, to a point the Carrick, also are really focused on that anti-capital ship role, but are quite flexible. And same with the Victory Star Destroyer, which was another favorite of his. So when it comes to positioning though, we learn from the Thrawn trilogy that most of the space battles between Thrawn and the New Republic, the big ones anyway, especially Bill Bringy, were fought with both fleets in a line formation, and the goal was really to break that line. So it's kind of a catch-22 when it comes to corvettes and smaller ships. You want them to be nearby to the larger ships so that they can help screen from fighters, but you don't want them the main target for enemy capital ships because then they'll get annihilated with a couple of turbo laser volleys. And that was one of the issues that the Lancer had, but there's really no answer to that. You've got to kind of make your estimation of where they can sit and be protected. Um, while also, you know, doing their job. Thrawn was also pretty aggressive with fighters, but again, he didn't... It, it seems like in these larger scale battles, he wasn't moving around his fleets a lot. His Star Destroyers were, solo, were sort of holding position, offering overlapping fields of fire. Um, so let's just see how this plays out here. Go ahead and engage these TIE fighters. He was usually pretty aggressive with his fighters. Uh, we're being attacked from behind by the Hapen, so that will mess up this example a little bit. Um, but Thrawn also typically used redundant interdictors. I think at the Battle of Bilbringi, he had like eight or something. That's probably a bit excessive. You don't need to do something like that for Empire at War. But it's always helpful to have at least one in reserve, um, especially when fighting... Um, Later on in the game, some of the factions will get very corvette heavy and it'll be really annoying to uh, chase them down. Especially in something like uh, Awakening of the Rebellion. 
So we always want to have at least one interdictor, but if I'm doing something with a very large fleet or I anticipate like a full scale battle, like a scrum, I will uh, try to have a redundant one uh, available on call at least if possible. Let's finish him. Taking fire. So yeah, basic line formation. It looks nice. I'm um, using the main benefits of the Star Destroyers, which is those big guns uh, on each side of the superstructure that basically just point forward. And uh, pretty simple. Obviously, the uh, the Hape and Raid fleet kind of messed this example up a little bit. But the nice thing, too, about having strike cruisers or um, dreadnoughts in the fleet or Carracks or whatever other small ship you have is that if the battle gets to the point where it is truly like a big scrum, they're much, much more mobile than Star Destroyers. Um, so like if you have a ship back, like say I want to take out this Assault Frigate, which might be out of range of these Star Destroyers, you know, the Dreadnoughts and the Strike Cruisers are much more mobile. Um, so yeah, I probably would have moved this, uh, this formation a little tighter, but just in my experience, it actually does work very well. Um, for Empire at War, especially with Star Destroyers. And if you have a new Republic fleet and sort of a combination of Star Destroyers and Mon Calamari cruisers, it works very, very well. But let's move on. Oh, and as a note, sorry, as that Star Destroyer is destroyed, you have to actively manage ships during battle. I haven't really been doing that because I've been talking to you guys, but just make sure that you always set a target for your capital ships. You don't want them just sitting there like they were there. Um, even if it just means control clicking ships of a certain type, all your Star Destroyers, putting them towards an enemy. Um, if you really want to get into minute detail, it helps to have ships target a different hard point specifically. After you destroy a target, there's sort of like a couple of seconds where it continues to fire on it, um, and it doesn't do any damage. So you want to really be cycling targets pretty quickly. Um, so just keep that in mind. Alright, so the next technique I wanted to talk about is actually one of my favorite things to do in Empire at War, and that is, quite simply, stealing ships. Now, unfortunately, this feature is not available in the current version of Thrawn's Revenge, just because it's bugged out. I'm sure it'll be fixed very soon, and the devs are aware of it. But, it's basically a way to get free capital ships after paying the down price of a capture shuttle, or the down payment price of a capture shuttle. Now, I do plan to do an entire... Um, technique video on how this works eventually Here's once it is fixed because that's one thing you guys have asked for a lot if you watch some of my older New Republic playthroughs you can kind of get a good idea of how to do it um, but for the meantime really the key thing is you want to isolate the most valuable ship so there's not a whole lot at this battle that's worth stealing or that I would go out of my way to steal in this case I would go for the MC-80 Liberty um, but you pay, I think it's $15,000. You can't even build it in the current version because it's bugged out. You pay 15,000 credits um, for a enemy ship, or sorry, for a capture vessel. If you capture this MC-80 Liberty, that alone is like $6,000 back. Um, so you've paid for half of it already. If you capture something like a Star Destroyer, that's like 8,000 credits. So really, you only need to be successful a couple of times um, to really... Uh, to really pay back what it's worth. So there's there are a few key things you need to do. The first is enemy sh or sorry, your own ships will not really listen to you when you say um, don't shoot at something. So you have to make sure that by the time your target vessel is taking fire that you're ready to capture it. One of the best ways to do this is to destroy all nearby ships. Um, and part of this also comes down to intelligence. When I'm playing as the New Republic, my first few weeks are basically finding uh, fleets that only have one or two ships, but um, especially a Star Destroyer, um, eliminating the escort, and then taking the capital ship. And right there, you've basically added immensely to your navy. Um, so some of that comes down to intelligence. Use the techniques we talked about earlier to find out where there's some smaller fleets, uh, especially isolated ones, and then, you know, get that bag. <laughs> so... One thing I will note too is the last version of Thrawn's Revenge and probably whichever version fixes the issue with the capture shuttle does also have a little oddity where if the capital ship you're capturing is the last thing that's on the map, 
sometimes the match won't end and you'll just be kind of stuck in purgatory. You can't even retreat or auto resolve. So if I wanted to capture this Mon Calamari cruiser, um, first of all, this battle would be exactly the one that I would try to focus on. I would destroy all surrounding ships, or at least weaken them quite significantly, with the exception of like, I'd leave, you know, something pretty durable, but not really dangerous, like a, a dreadnought. And then I would just focus in on the, um, I'd focus it on the Liberty. By the time its shield is nearing low, you jump in the capture shell, pretend that this Ton Fak is one. Um, and then I would usually just start, you've got five capture attempts. Uh, I just start spamming it basically by the time the, uh, the shields are down. There have been battles where I've made off with like three Allegiance class battle carriers, or sorry, battle cruisers. And I think that's worth like 30 or 40,000 credits. Um, so not only are you taking those ships out of the battle, but they fight for you during the battle, and then afterwards you add them to your fleet. So a pretty great technique. Thrawn did this, as I mentioned, at the Battle of Sluis Van, where he focused on capturing Mon Calamari cruisers and CR-90s and other things. Um, he wasn't really successful because of plot reasons, but um, any ship that you can get without paying for is great. The start of the New Republic campaign also has all of these planets to the southeast. They just have Dreadnought class heavy cruisers. I mean, not the best ship, but you can use them as pathfinders. You can use them in some of those uh, bait techniques that I showed you in the other video. And they're just, it's just free capital ships. Thrawn wasn't above using Dreadnought class heavy cruisers. Why would you be? All right, guys, that's really it. That's all I have for now. I know this was kind of a short video and we were just really covering some basic elements of Empire at War, but I hope by showing you how Thrawn used these in the Expanded Universe that maybe you gained a new appreciation for them, whether as somebody who uses them in Empire at War or as somebody who really likes Grand Admiral Thrawn within Star Wars Legends. There were a few other things I didn't mention one thing that Thrawn does in the outbound flight is basically prove the advantage of dictating the uh, parameters of starfighter combat. So especially in mods like Awakening of the Rebellion, where, you know, one or two squadrons of starfighters can make a difference, it's really beneficial if you can fight the starfighter battles on your terms. Fight them where you have um, more fighters, fight them closer to your frigates or your uh, corvettes. One way you can do that is basically by kiting them across the map, bringing them close um, to your defensive line, and then counterattacking. But that's kind of outside the scope of today's video. I want to do a whole thing on starfighter strategy generally. I think there are better mods for that than Thrawn's Revenge because it seems to me like fighters are a little underpowered in the current version of this mod, and that's something they'll be working on to change later from my understanding. But let me know what you thought of this video. Is there a specific Thrawn strategy that you liked best? Did you learn anything? Do you like these kind of videos where we take Star Wars EU knowledge and sort of put them on the screen? Let me know all of that and more down in the comments section. But guys, this has been your host, Eckhart's Ladder. Hope you have a great one. As always, be safe and may the Force be with you.